This is the second stop on uh, a book tour for two new books of mine. One is called The Diary of a Radical Cancer Warrior, Fighting Cancer and Capitalism at the Cellular Level. And the latest one, Raw Extreme Manifesto. Change your body, change your mind, change the world by spending almost nothing. Now, if you're a member of Teatro Vida or a friend of Teatro Vida, you will get all of my CDs at half price tonight, and you will get $5 off this book and some other books. <laughs> so please get many. <laughs> Rather than read from these two books, <laughs> Gotta steal it. <laughs> but that's another book. Somebody else got that title. Um, I'm going to summarize each book and then take some questions from, from all of you and we can turn up the house lights. This book is a real-time diary that began in August of 2006 when I was first diagnosed with at that time, that was labeled advanced 3B, stage, uh, stage 3B colorectal cancer. In five and a half years, there have been six tumors, four colorectal, and the latest two metastasized to my lung and my left groin. In that time, I used everything devised by Western medical science to fight cancer, including 10 surgeries, three rounds of chemotherapy using all six chemotherapy drugs made for colorectal cancer, and I can name them very easily, fluorouracil, oxaliplatinin, leucovorin, zolota, cetuximab or Herbitux, and renotecan. Uh, I also had radiation treatment. And the first tumor, I was given two out of three chances of living. Not too bad. This recurrence that came back three months after I finished the chemotherapy, I was given less than one in two chances of living when that tumor re recurred in the exact same place <coughs> and almost the same size. We hit that tumor with two rounds of chemotherapy, another s multiple series of surgeries. I lost my left kidney. And uh, I had a temporary ileostomy bag that was meant to basically collect my stool and relieve my colorectal system. That was reversed, meaning that hole uh, was uh, plugged up again and uh, then another tumor happened now in a different area in the rectum. It was diagnosed in a, in a colonoscopy uh, December of 2008. And then I was given one in 30,000 chances by Memorial Sloan Kettering, whose slogan is the best cancer everywhere, anywhere. But I'd like to relabel their slogan, the most arrogant cancer anywhere. <laughs> I gave up Western medical science. I went completely naturopathic, which is the opposite of allopathic, which is the Western paradigm of cut, burn, poison, cut, surgery, burn, radiation, poison, chemotherapy. And I devised a series of alternative pro protocols, which are listed here, too, many, too numerous to share with you, including the use of an illegal treatment that uh, is illegal in uh, uh, 39 states in the United States, ozone treatment. And uh, when uh, the fourth tumor came around, uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering, third tumor Memorial Sloan Kettering gave me 130,000 chances of living, the fourth tumor they gave me no chances of living. And now that I'm stage 4B metastatic, it's terminal. So when my end will happen, it could be the end of this year, maybe sometime in 2013. Certainly, I'd be really be pushing the numbers if I lasted to 2014. So I know my end is um, a certainty. Um, so out of this experience, there are four, five strategies that I've developed in fighting cancer. 
These are one, nutrition, two, hydrogenation, hydrogenation, three, oxygenation, four, love, and five, self-healing. And the self-healing part of it is the naturopathic paradigm. But let me just explain the fourth one, love. What kept me alive during this time was just not my own personal strength and desire to live. Because for three, for three occasions, I, I basically gave up. I wanted to commit suicide. And I'll tell you about that in a minute. But it was the Warriors for Fred, a self-organized group that included Magdalena Gomez, Jennifer Fowle, Padgett Walker, and my general, Nana, Queen Mother, and T. Green. And that warrior, Warriors for Fred did everything to make sure the war was going to be fought with tenacity and with compassion, including accompanying me to hospital visits, taking notes when doctors were running down a whole litany of medical terminology, um, cleaning my toilets, feeding me, uh, washing me as I was lying in my feces in the hospital bed and the nurses wouldn't do it. When I had a fever of 104 degrees, uh, finding a garbage bag and filling it up with ice from the ice machine and burying me in ice, which was the only thing that lowered the fever, all those kinds of things. That's what the Warriors for Fred were about. But also they um, prevented me from committing suicide on three occasions. The first occasion, was after tumor number three was cut out. And the surgeon didn't tell me as I was recuperating that he couldn't sew me back up again. That I had so many surgeries beforehand that my skin, there was so much scar tissue that my skin was like frayed fabric. When you stick a needle through it and try to pull it through, it would just rip. So he gave up. And the next day, he went to go speak at a conference in the Midwest and didn't tell me that's the situation. So I was discharged, went home. For 12 days and nights, I couldn't sleep because of searing pain. Any movement was like a knife cutting through me. And so my good friend Stephanie Athey, who's a specialist on torture, said that to me, <laughs> that this was torture. When you can't sleep, when you're in constant pain, all you want to do is to end it. So that's why torture doesn't work. It doesn't work because basically the torture victim will tell you whatever you wanted to end the pain. That was the first time. Second time was when I couldn't come here, uh, April of 2011, because on April 1st, after six months of my radical alternative naturopathic pathway, my condition plummeted. I was in bed for 23 hours a day. I felt the very life force inside of me was being wrung out and uh, I felt terrible, miserable and I wanted to end it there and I asked two comrades from Scientific Soul Sessions, one of whom was a botanist, plant specialist, find me some kind of herb that would just kill me and give it to me. Well, my two friends didn't comply with my wish so I went through Another radical surgery that included the removal of my bladder. I don't have a bladder anymore. Removal of my prostate, removal of my rectum. So I now live with a colostomy and a urostomy bag. So I've had all three. Very few people have all three. I've had an ileostomy, a colostomy, and a urostomy. Okay, so that means I shit in a bag and I piss in a bag. And I can, can't control it because I have no muscles anymore. I don't have any organs. Okay, um, so the third time I tried to commit suicide was after this surgery that removed these organs, this massive surgery that took 16 hours and three surgeons, including a cosmetic surgeon who had to remove muscle and tissue from both my thighs in order to fill in the space left by the removal of these organs. Why do you have to do that? Because any liquid that collects in that space causes infection. <coughs> And I did have an infection. I had an infection of 105.8 for 10 hours. At 106, your brain boils and you're dead. 
I was 0.2 degrees away from my brain boiling. Um, during that time, after the many surgeries, I had inflamed intestines, meaning that my intestines were, had been so traumatized that they had ballooned up and no liquid or food could pass through me. So as you know, I was trying to get better from surgery, I was trying to get my strength back, trying to eat, drink again, all that was collecting inside of me. And for two days straight, I was constantly vomiting and three young friends come to me at the hospital at that time and just were constantly bringing me a plastic bucket to vomit into. And uh, I wanted it to end. Um, I was probably, the, the hospital jokingly said I had more tubes in, connected to me than any other patient they've ever seen, uh, including this drainage tube that went through my nose and down into my esophagus. It was 24 seven pulling out this green bile that accumulated there. Uh, so I was lying in bed in pain, miserable, and I asked to speak to my friend, Ann Green, my general. And I said to her, Ann, it would have been best if I had died on the operating table. She gave me the hardest look I've ever seen from anyone. She said to me, too many people have worked too hard to keep you alive. Don't you dare die on us now. <laughs> Spooked the hell out of me. I could stare death in the face, but not Anne Green. <laughs> so I pulled through. I didn't eat for 20 days, 28 days. I was on liquid IV nutrition. I lost 80 pounds. When I could eat again, I made sub sandwiches with a lot of mayonnaise, <laughs> fatty salami, so I gained back 40, 40 pounds. During this cancer war, I, when, I, when basically I was written off and I had pretty much rejected Western medical science, I devised a radical extreme protocol. And I'm gonna only talk about one of those protocols, which is the featured subject of the Raw Extreme book. And that was completely overnight changing my diet to all raw food, or what they call live food, including the removal of all sugars from fruits, juices, dried fruits, beets, carrots, corn, and tomatoes, vegetables that were high fruit producing, and primarily eat greens, primarily cruciferous vegetables that I juiced, that included celery, ginger, uh, parsley for a little bit more uh, edge off the, t off the um, flavor. And um, it was not a cure, but it had tremendous other benefits. Why isn't it a cure? Because there is no such thing and there will never be a cure for cancer as long as capitalism exists. Because here is the profound paradox that I've challenged the medical industry and not one person can respond to this. Here's the profound paradox. Cancer types are the most and cancer rates are the highest in the most affluent societies on this planet. Very low among the so-called primitive peoples. And advanced and the, and, the, and the most affluent societies, paradoxically, have the most advanced medical technologies as well. Let me say that again. Cancer types and cancer rates are the highest in the most technologically advanced and affluent societies on this planet. So that's why nobody in the cancer medical field can claim there's a cure. There is a vaccine for the human papillomavirus for cervical cancer, but it's not a cure. It's a, it's a vaccine. But there is no cure because there is no cause of it that can be understood within their paradigm. Because the cause of it is the very capitalist, industrial, modern existence itself. 
and the pervasiveness of social and environmental toxicity. So, capitalism is the cancer for Mother Earth. It is teratogenic, Earth-killing. And cancer is the manifestation of capitalism, the plethora of social and environmental toxicity in the individual. And that's the profound connection that I came to understand. So anybody who uses the word cure, it may apply to certain individuals who certain tipping points in certain, their, their own particular cancer may not be as aggressive or they caught it early enough. There may be an individual cure, but the word cure only applies to statistical probability, meaning that if you make it beyond 10 years, you're quote unquote cured, even though you still have cancer cells inside of you, you're cured because you made it to 10 years. So that's a statistical term, not an actual term of truth. It takes 1 billion cancer cells to form a tumor the size of one centimeter. So my original tumor was 5.5 centimeters. So it was at least more than 5 billion cells. So we all have cancer. Depending on our conditions, depending upon our interaction with the matrix, it all will manifest at different times. So it's not a question if you'll get cancer, it'll be a question of when you'll get it. So that's why the conservative group the American Cancer Society says that in 50 years, one out of two American men will get cancer, and one out of three American women will get cancer. There is no cure, and as long as industrial capitalism exists, it will get worse. That's why you have to be a revolutionary, and you have to imagine existence no longer with the two principal carcinogens. There are many, but the two principal ones. One existed for a very, very long time, and that is smoke and fire, carbon, and also radiation from the sun. Though that hasn't become a problem until modern times. Where is the largest rate, the highest rate of skin cancer? Over Australia, because that's where the ozone doesn't exist anymore. So skin cancer is very, very high in Australia. What's the other one that's pervasive, that is part of the very fabric of modern existence? electromagnetic radiation, everything here, your cell phones. That's going to be the next cigarette type of expose. Cigarettes were only labeled as causing cancer. That cause word took 20 years of battle to finally get Congress and the Surgeon General to apply that statement. Cigarette smoking causes cancer. Well, the rest of the language today is put you at risk. But it's not, a, they're too chicken, too, too cowardly to describe the cause. But, but cell phones will be the next cigarette. So that's why the, one of the fastest growing types of cancers is brain cancer. So let's imagine existence without most electromagnetic magnetic, magnetic radiation, most industrialism, which is the cause for most pollution. That's the revolutionary question we have to face. So what did the raw extreme diet do for me? The elimination of sugar, certainly all carbs, certainly all cooked foods. Why is raw important? Well, raw food is the maximum nutritional density from food. Supplements and vitamins, in my opinion, not only don't work, they also are carcinogenic, as studies and tests are beginning to re reveal particularly the water-insoluble vitamins. That's not vitamin C. So, the best source of your nutrition is from actual food. But our food sources are so degraded from industrial food production that most of us don't know what a real tomato tastes like. Plus, plus a lot of it is genetic, genetically, genetically modified, so that tomato you're eating probably has fish genes in it. So we have to grow our own food. And in fact, we have to eliminate this capitalist economy of accumulation and replace it with an economy of subsistence in which only needs are addressed, not wants. And it's a whole reconfiguration and reimagining of our, of our existence. 
But that existence has only been a very short time. For example, plastics, ubiquitous now, but have only been in existence 70 years. Before World War II, plastics were virtually non-existent. What's the problem with plastics? When you throw plastic away, it degrades and becomes dioxin, the most lethal, one of the most lethal chemicals you can find. So where is the highest concentration of dioxin today? Mother's breast milk. It's probably correlated to why breast cancer is the number one cancer for women. Again, no one uses the cause word. So the raw diet, the diet of primitive peoples, is nature's perfect food. And here are the things that it can cure. I will stand by this and use the C word, cure, because it worked for me. It will cure hypertension. When I went on a raw extreme diet, I began to lose one pound a day. In 40 days, no matter how much raw food I ate, I would still lose a pound a day. In 40 days, I lost 40 pounds. In two and a half weeks, when I first, before I started the raw diet, my blood pressure, hypertension, was 170 over 120. In two and a half weeks, it was 120 over 80. In four weeks, it was 110 over 70. Hypertension cured. Amlodipine Norvask, the popular prescription drug for high blood pressure, only dropped my blood pressure by five points. What's the cost of Amlodipine Norvask? I know, something like, you know, $100 for six pills. Raw food fixed my hypertension in two and a half weeks. What else does it cure? It cures, cures diabetes. I was borderline diabetic. In three months, diabetes gone. Never came back again. What else can it fix? Heart disease. Your arteries, after three or four months of the raw food diet, will be cleaning themselves. But it can't cure cancer. Nothing can cure cancer because cancer cells grow eight to ten times faster than anything natural inside of your body. And cancer is not a disease. That's the mistaken notion. It is not a disease. It is a genetic mutation. It is when your healthy cells become malignant. So cancer and capitalism are the same thing. They're not diseases, they're processes. Both of them are accelerative malignant processes. Not a disease, but a process. You cannot cure a process. You can only end it. That is why no matter how much technology is spent upon cancer, the best that it can do is earlier detection. But a lot of the methods, the radiographic methods themselves are carcinogen, carcinogenic. And this coming out now in the popular media. Should you be doing MRIs and CT, PT scans continuously? No, because one scan is about 200 times the amount of radiation you'll get from walking through an X-ray machine at the airport. So if you have 10 of those scans, that's about 2,000 times. And after a while, the tipping point will be reached where your natural immune system can't fight or correct that malignancy. So that's why cancer and capitalism are inextricable. That's why there'll never be a cure. If you think there's going to be a cure, you're a fool. Go through what I go through. Fight it with everything they have to offer, and you'll see. The only thing that will happen is what the naturopathic paradigm refuses to be.
Naturopathic paradigm is three things. One, your treatment should have almost no side effects. Two, your treatment should not diminish the quality of your life. And three, your treatment should cost almost nothing because it's given to you by Mother Earth. So, naturopathy, again, can't cure, capitalism, can't cure cancer as long as you're capitalism. What it's good for? Palliative treatment, making, making you feel better, optimizing your health, optimizing your body to keep fighting. That's what I credit for my prolonged situation. Optimizing it to the maximum. What else can it do for you? Wellness. Sense of self-transformation. Empowerment for self-healing. Instead of pharmacologicalizing everything. I take no medication. Because my treatment is both a combination of the allopathic, but how I maintain myself is naturopathic. So this is a handbook. This is a handbook of how to fight cancer. This is a handbook of how to go naturopathically. I don't advocate buying pills, buying supplements, that sort of thing. In fact, my, my, there was a lot of research that I did in this, in this war and I talk about all the scams with um, uh, homeopathic treatments and so forth. Why do they all come out of Utah? Because Orrin Hatch, for instance, <laughs> senator from Utah, basically prevented anything uh, developed naturopathically out of Utah to be under federal regulation so it can make any claim that it can without being regulated. So all those things, all those scams, all those, uh, you know, uh, blind alleys, dead ends, I talk about in real time. So this is a valuable book, book, book for yourself in terms of understanding the matrix and how you can combat the matrix, but also for any friends that you find that are going through the cancer war, how to best be prepared. And I think the best preparation is something I've learned philosophically. I've had many physical losses. I've lost four organs. I have constant peripheral neuropathy, meaning that I have pain and numbness and loss of, de loss of dexterity in my fingers and my feet. I can't play the saxophone as well as I used to play in terms of technique and velocity, you know, but I made up for that in terms of breath and other things. So many physical losses, but tremendous phil philosophical gains of which the two primary ones are the greatest toxicity you're going to face in terms of social toxicity is ego and competition. Eliminate it. And then the second thing is um, the necessity to make love central in your life. You know, and uh, uh, that uh, is a profound thing that most of us don't truly understand because our concept of love is narcissistic. We want to be loved, but we don't make love central in terms of what we give and what we put out and what we leave. Um, so uh, uh, I'm going to end here with the summary of my books. I hope you pick them up. Accept the truth, no matter who the messenger is and how it's delivered. If you rant and rave and scream and yell and swear at me, if there's 1%, one percent, one kernel of truth, find it, accept it. Two, all the things that you thought mattered, such as professional stature, recognition, money, career, eliminate it. I don't work in the music industry anymore. I ended that a while back. I only do special projects. And I hold myself and everyone around me to the highest standard. 
this is not a gig. This is because you want to be with me on this journey. Don't disrespect yourself and don't disrespect me. Come with full integrity and that's it. If you don't have it, we're done. We're done. I don't have time to waste. My time is so precious to me right now. You know? And I guess the third thing about ego is um, expect nothing. No expectations. You know, let your karma speak for itself. So I, I, I uh, am very happy right now. I'm very productive. Uh, I guess I'm living the samurai credo, living while preparing for death. So I've cemented my musical legacy. There's no dispute what I've been able to do and accomplish and create at great cost to myself, personally. Great cost that few people can even imagine. The constant miracles I had to do in terms of my operas and my shows and everything else with very, very few resources or support. And I was slugging out, competing, you know, and I felt the best armor or best weapon I had at that time was ego. Proved to be fatal for me. So I paid the price. I paid the price, you know. My death is imminent. But that's not going to be a death based upon submission. I'm fighting to the end. So my integrity, my dignity, all those things, that's my quality of life. I may not be able to play as fast as I used to be able to do, I'm going to dominate 24-7 by two ostomy bags that rule my life. All these kinds of things. But, you know, that is not what's front and center. And I don't allow it to be front and center. You know, uh, they have to go through my boot camp. Because what I'm giving them is what I had to learn the hard way in 40 years. And I don't want them to get cancer. So that's why it's hard. And you have to be willing to accept that. But I'm giving away everything. You can't take it with you to the afterlife. I mean, I'm not like the pharaohs. So I'm not going to mummify everything. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm giving it all away. And nothing I'm holding on to. And there's nothing I seek to have or accumulate except for wisdom creativity and love. Those are the only things that, are, that matter to me now, right now. So all my physical losses have given me tremendous philosophical gains. So I'm, on a, you know, I'm, I, I'm sharing that. And the last thing you know, is, is uh, I'm very clear what my mission is. I went to hell three times and I met God in hell. God doesn't exist in heaven. God exists in hell. That's where you, make you, you meet your maker and you find out what you're really made out of. And he said, to, he said to me, get the fuck out of here. Get back there. You haven't done what you're supposed to do. I'm not accepting you yet. And what is that? My mission on this planet for what time I have left is to do the art and music and politics no one else can or will do. Just that. Just that. So what have I done in the music situation? Well, I, did, I rejected the music industry, so I created my own infrastructure. So I can do any project I want to do. But it only requires people who want to go on that journey with me at the standard that I expect to be at. Period. There's no negotiation. Accept or decline. Done. No compromise. Let me read the rules of the Raw Fight Club. <laughs> Rule number one, no compromise. Rule number two, no compromise. If you compromise, you will be kicked out of Raw Fight Club. <laughs> Rule number three, everyone must fight, no exceptions. If you're new, you must fight first. Number four, anyone can draw, join Raw Fight Club. 
Anyone can leave Raw Fight Club at any time. Number five, you must talk about Raw Fight Club. Number six, you must fight to win. That's the self-organized group called the Raw Fight Club. People who taught each other live or, or, or raw food extremism. There's a mixture of things, some of it which were very adolescent, you know, trying to be cool, that sort of stuff. Uh, but I think the main thing was a way to channel the anger I had about oppression, about all the racism and discrimination I felt growing up here in this community. And uh, it was the black arts movement, black power movement that systematized and theorized my experiences and I saw similarities, parallels. And um, the music was the way in which my adolescent frustrations uh, were directed in a creative and productive way. To regenerate creativity, to find within yourself, even when you're terribly sick, uh, possibilities to hear, explore things. For example, when I came back from the first surgery, I had a commission. Uh, I came back early October. My commission was uh, going to premiere the Guggenheim Museum on November 4th. And uh, I tried to take out my baritone. And in 30 seconds, I could barely get a sound out of it. And uh, I was very depressed. So I called up the empresario and said, you have to find someone else. I won't be ready. They were very understanding. Um, but in my recovery process, I had to learn how to breathe again. I had to, I basically have to learn how to play now with no diaphragm because if you, if I took off my clothes right here, you would see everything cut up. I had to learn how to, you know, uh, breathe without a diaphragm anymore. Um, and so I can hold long notes without circular breathing, though I could cheat and do circular breathing. I consider circular breathing, with the exception of people like Rossan Roland Kirk and Dizzy Gillespie, to basically be gimmicking. But I basically connected with my deep sea diving techniques and applied that to repairing my breathing methodology. And so that musical challenge was a way for me to discover how to transcend the physical loss that was irreparable. So, um, Music, you know, is a spiritual thing because in my darkest hours of chemo hell, I would watch old movies of the greatest Muhammad Ali and his indomitable spirit inspired me. So I composed the Sweet Science Suite, a tribute to scientific soul music honoring Muhammad Ali, which um, has become a small hit right now. It'll go on tour next year, regardless of whether I'm alive or not, and uh, end up at the Brooklyn Academy of Music Next Wave Festival and Apollo Theater. It's got marvelous choreography by Crystal Brown, who was with Bill T. Jones and uh, Urban Bushwomen. Um, but I wrote that piece during those darkest hours. I did it in six weeks' time. Work for the Green Monster Big Band. So creativity doesn't have to just be music. It can be many other things. I mean, I kept myself creatively challenged. I designed new clothes during that time. The raw food thing meant that I could get rid of most of my kitchen. My stove and oven are permanently turned off. You know, and I found such liberation in making small but radical and extreme steps. How many of you can turn off your stove and your oven permanently? You couldn't. I've, I've, my, my stove and oven have been turned off now for 16 months. Now, I'm an omnivore and I do eat 50% cooked food nowadays, particularly when I travel, I'm much more at the mercy of the food industrial complex. So I recognize that. But you know, you find new outlets for creativity, and that creativity defines your new being. So for example, when I started my blog, that's the diary, I would get a lot of emails and people contact me saying, 
what do I need to do to get back to my old life? I said, forget about it. You don't want to go back to that old carcinogenic life. If you want that from me, I'm not going to give it to you because I don't want to go back. So let it go, change, move on, move on to a new, to a new being that will free you. Uh, I said, you know, in my performance piece that it has to be indigenous centric. Everything here in North America was better before the arrival of the European invasion. Everything. It did not need capitalism here because it was self-sufficient and it was ecocentric, meaning that humanity lived in partnership with nature. So just because you have flat screen TVs or cars or computers, does that mean your existence is better? The existence that we can hardly imagine now because it's been so destroyed, but the little bit of information we get actually from native peoples and also from anthropological data is that life and humanity was better. Across the board in any measurement, except destructive capability. That's what's better today. The ability to destroy is far quicker and far more profound than, than ever. What else? I said indigenous centric. It's got to be ecocentric, meaning that humanity has to submit and subordinate itself to nature, to the ecosystems. We're part of it. And yes, it is part of our nature to be technological, but our understanding of technology should be Luddite. Not anti-technology, but against all forms of technology that's harmful or hurtful to the commons, to humanity and to the planet. Now we can debate and discuss what that is, where, where that line is going to be, but we have to engage it and we have to begin it fast because the tipping point according to the conservative National Academy of Science, the official scientific advisor to the U.S. government, is that the tipping point in terms of climate change and species extinction is probably about two years away. So I don't think we're going to make it. So that's why I'm much more into prefiguration, the building of shuttlecrafts. If the mothership is headed to destruction, then we have to have shuttlecrafts, and that's what I'm interested in building, shuttlecrafts. I don't want to take everyone with me on the shuttlecraft, to be frank with you. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not interested in taking anyone, everyone with me. Only the ones who really want to get on board and do the work. And lastly, matriarchal or matricentric, <laughs> in the sense that the other two things, ecocentrism or subordinating, submitting to Mother Earth, and indigenous centrism, which was based upon the clan as the family unit, not the nuclear family, were manifestations of matriarchy, or the fact that uh, the role of mothers or grandmothers in particular was how humanity reproduced itself and developed itself, developed from the point of view of education. So the Iroquois, to this day, is official matriarchy. It's in their constitution. Um, there are many societies that were matriarchal in the past, but many of them wiped out or it's been altered. But the Malankabao in southwestern, uh, southwestern uh, Sumatra are official matriarchy. You know, and their principle is that nature teaches us all we need to know. So these are very complex ideas. A lot of them are in my book. You know, you should read my matriarchy, first and final communism, other things like that. And so there is a group, small, of revolutionary thinkers, activists, organizers, engaging these ideas. Some of them I helped organize in New York called Scientific Soul Sessions, or Eco-Socialist Horizons is another group, a sister group of ours, that are exploring these things in the context of prefiguration, of how do you create that change that we need to have now. So there's a popular slogan, be the change you want to see. 
Well, that's the application to organize social relations. So um, that's my thinking. But the matrix has to, the matrix has to be ended. We have to end it. We can't swallow that pill anymore. You know. But many of us use the rat race as a justification, but it's no justification. But you know, my books talk about how you can change that very specifically. We joke sometimes because Magdalene and I have thrift, sh thrift shop competition. Without ego. <laughs> Without ego. <laughs> but uh, here's, here's one thing I'll assert, that if you stopped production of everything today, just what the rich throw away, not everybody, just the rich, is enough to make everyone live comfortably for two generations. So we have excess. So the diseases we have, cancer, heart disease, obesity, those are the diseases of affluence, not the diseases of poverty like malaria, like starvation, like malnutrition. Well, though we have malnutrition because it's associated with the obesity since we consume all the wrong stuff, but not malnutrition because of scarcity. So we live in a very interesting paradox. You know, that is, has colonized us down to our cellular level. That we have to decolonize ourselves. And that decolonization pro process is an arduous one like it is on the political level in terms of colonized, oppressed peoples overcoming the mental, physical, socio-environmental shackles of their external conquerors. Same thing we have to do now in terms of dealing with the matrix of accumulation, consumption, waste, industrial technocentrism, mass production, the factory system, so the socialist concept of a socialist factory is incorrect, just like patriarchal socialism is incorrect. So that manifest destiny Marxism that infected all of the 20th century, all of it, we have to break with. That doesn't mean break with Marxism per se, because communism or Marx, what Marx and Engels un understood communism to be was based upon the Iroquois. So if you study the origin of family, private pro 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 property, and state, or Marx's anthropological notebooks of the last six years of his life, he was trying to understand what a communist society would be, and his main attention was focused upon the Iroquois. The greatest democracy this planet has ever seen, greater than the United States, greater than Greece or Rome, which had slaves. The United States had slaves. The Iroquois had no prison industrial complex, no military, no taxation, you know, no mass production, no, uh, it, you know, uh, mass scale agriculture. That's the profound revolution. And how do you make it happen on a cellular level for yourself, people around you? That's the challenge. Because this matrix as it is right now is already collapsing on its own accord. It's already collapsing. So the nonprofit industrial complex, most of these arts organizations are done. That's why I got out. You know? If you're hustling for a gig or a place or a little sit paycheck from them, I just think you're a fool. You know, rather than becoming self-reliant, self-determined, create your own infrastructure. So I've been able to do that. I put out eight records in the last three years. You know? But I made certain choices. You know, I don't have, I don't have children. I didn't buy into the marriage or the monogamy or the nuclear family, so I don't have those kinds of bills. I don't have a cell phone. I don't, never owned a car, so I don't have those bills. Anyone else? Well, I would like to s just uh, think we should move along at this moment. Sure. Um, I want to thank uh, Fred and Ben. Please come on over.
Magdalena for a beautiful opening. All of you who came out tonight.